There's a lyric in Andy Williams' 1963 Christmas Standard, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year, that used to perplex me. There'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories. I used to think, why scary ghost stories for Christmas? Isn't that for Halloween? At the time, I was right for wondering this. Christmas has almost no association with the ghostly in the 21st century. It wasn't until I was older, watching BBC's eerie annual series A Ghost Story for Christmas, and reading the work of author M.R. James, that I became aware of a long-standing tradition of gathering around the fire on Christmas Eve and telling tales of the supernatural. It's a custom that, until quite recently, was as honored as singing carols or decorating a tree. Whenever five or six English-speaking people meet round a fire on Christmas Eve, they start telling each other ghost stories, said humorist Jerome K. Jerome in his 1891 collection, Told After Supper. Nothing satisfies us on Christmas Eve but to hear each other tell authentic anecdotes about specters. It is a genial, festive season, and we love to muse upon graves and dead bodies and murders and blood. But somewhere in the second half of the 20th century, this tradition of telling ghost stories slipped away. It's not uncommon for traditions to disappear with the passage of time. There were hundreds of bizarre, discontinued Christmas customs that are, well, not missed. Like the bizarre motif of frogs seen here in Victorian Christmas cards. Or this dead bird card. Or this creepy radish guy. Or this other dead bird card. The, uh, th there were a lot of dead birds. I, I don't think anyone is lamenting the loss of this imagery. But likewise, there are plenty of equally bizarre and archaic customs that we continue to celebrate, like nailing socks over the fire and going to church. Hell, my family used to do the tradition of hiding a pickle in the tree on Christmas Eve, and the first person to find it got to open a present early. The only reason we stopped doing that is because my family is too competitive and it wasn't fun, not because it's a bizarre thing to do. Traditions are weird. Often we perpetuate them for the sole reason of, well, tradition, without even understanding the greater cultural meaning behind them, as Mark Twain once said. The less justification we have for a custom, the harder it is to get rid of. So my question is two-pronged. Why did we tell ghost stories for Christmas? And then, why did we stop? To really understand everything, we have to go back. Before Christmas, before Jesus even, the eponymous Christ of Christmas. Back to the Paleolithic Age, an age where apparently everyone was on the perfect diet. These were the early days of human civilization and human communication and the dawn of artistic expression. In the late Paleolithic era, humans were starting to paint on cave walls, craft sculptures, create religious ceremonies, bury and honor the dead, and, of course, tell narratives. Early tribes would huddle around the fire for warmth and convey stories, often through dance or performance. Stories of spirituality, heroism, sexuality, and the big, terrifying things lurking out in the woods waiting to tear you to pieces. These latter stories were especially potent because humans were coexisting with things that look like this, and because they spoke to the very immediate fears of every human, the threats that each faced. As humans became more developed, as more sophisticated shelters were built, villages and cities eventually followed, humans gradually started to, at least, create the illusion of separating themselves from nature. With this, the practice of telling scary stories, of all the things lurking in the dark, became more quaint. Beasts in the woods were no longer immediate threats lurking all around us, they were threats lurking out there, in the cold, while we're in here, in the warmth. I believe there's some instinct embedded in all of us, whenever the weather turns cold, that makes us want to huddle together and tell stories to thrill and chill our bones, to have a good, healthy scare, to subconsciously remind ourselves of the threats we used to face. There's a line in Shakespeare's A Winter's Tale, a sad tale's best for winter. I have one of sprites and goblins. I can't help but think of the famous circumstances that inspired Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein, being holed up in a villa in Switzerland during the Second Ice Age. But this merely explains why we might be more inclined to tell scary stories during the winter, not specifically ghost stories during Christmas time. Ghosts, the universal memento mori, symbols of our hopes and fears for a human afterlife, will always reside best in the haunted chill of the winter solstice, the coldest and most treacherous time of the year time to brace against the elements, to preserve food, a time when the light dwindles, the end of the seasonal cycle, and thusly a time to acknowledge the year's losses, as well as our own mortality. This is true of many cultures all across the world. Winter carries themes of death, eventual rebirth. Christmas itself was birthed from a particular solstice celebration, the pagan festival known as Yule. It marked the death of light, taking place in the longest, darkest night of the year was coincidentally thought to be the time when the veil between the world of the living and the world of the dead was the thinnest. 
You will notice, too, that the holiday has a pretty good reason to be in the winter. Whereas Christmas, as you've probably heard, has no right being when it is, and Jesus was probably a Leo and not a Capricorn. It's been theorized that the Roman Empire moved his birthday to December 25th, the time of the pagan solstice festival, as a symbolic gesture showing a triumph of Christ over paganism, coinciding with a deliberate imperial campaign to criminalize polytheism while Christianity was on the rise. But they never could fully snuff out paganism, even though Christ's birth was meant to overshadow Yule forever. The association actually had the adverse effect. The word Yule may look familiar to you because apparently the logs carried over. But actually most of the holiday persists. In fact, our modern concept of Christmas is, ironically, way more pagan than Christian. Caroling, giving gifts, decorating a tree, kissing under the mistletoe, and fruitcake. That's all from Yule. And that's the foundation that Christmas is built on. Intrinsically entangled with themes of darkness, rebirth, regeneration, and ghosts. Let's skip ahead a few centuries. Christmas is a full-fledged holiday, a time of food and drink and cheer, and then it isn't. In the 17th century, a scroogey old miserly statesman and known asshat by the name of Oliver Cromwell wants Christmas dead in the name of Puritanism. He sought to end the decadence and debauchery that the holiday brought, under the pretense that Christmas isn't in the Bible and Jesus wasn't born in December. I mean, he wasn't wrong, he was just an asshole. He even went so far as to ban Christmas caroling. So by the time Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol comes around in 1843, the holiday was already in a major decline, with the echoes of Cromwell's Puritan campaign and the present Industrial Revolution basically ensuring that no one was having much Christmas cheer. For many, it was still a work day. So Dickens sought to cure England of its labor-obsessed apathy by conjuring up some nostalgia for the Christmas of old, by extolling charity and goodwill towards man. But the Christmas of old also meant ghosts, and all that dark Yule stuff too. So when A Christmas Carol was a smashing success, and basically revitalized and reshaped the modern concept of the holiday, it ensured a seemingly permanent association with Christmas and ghosts. The success of Dickens' story coincided with the rise of the ghost story as a major commercial genre, a mainstay of Victorian literature, but most importantly, it coincided with the rise of the Christmas industry, with the invention of the Christmas card, Christmas cracker, and other new, mass-produced, industrialized Christmas products. And it's this commercialization and commodification of Christmas that ultimately carries it into the 20th and 21st century. And somewhere along the way, it's responsible for killing off the ghost story tradition. Nearly every aspect of Christmas is now linked with some kind of commercial product. Giving gifts, receiving gifts, wrapping gifts. You listen to Christmas music, you buy or stream that. It's a huge industry in and of itself. Even going to visit your family, airlines bank on the fact that there's no place like home for the holidays. I'm starting to sound a little like Linus, and I'm sorry, but that reminds me too. There's Christmas movies and TV specials, and what I like to call the Hallmark Industrial Complex. What I'm trying to say, Telling ghost stories around the winter fire has no place in contemporary Christmas because there's no transaction to be had. The oral tradition of storytelling itself is all but faded, too. Though ghost stories aren't dead, the act of telling them aloud is restricted to campfire tales or sleepovers. And I know what you're thinking. What about ghost literature and ghost movies and other media? Well, those now play a part in sustaining another hugely commercial Western holiday that used to be pagan but is now an excuse to sell M&Ms, Halloween. And Halloween's brand is everything spooky. And by proximity to Christmas time, it makes sense commercially why they would want to keep those two things separate. Halloween is spooky candy costume time, and Christmas is happy drinky shoppy air travel time. So the real answer of why do we not tell ghost stories at Christmas anymore? It's capitalism. Well, well, if it isn't our old friend. So Christmas ghost stories are gone. Ghosts themselves of a dead tradition. But I think we should try to honor it and keep it alive. It is free after all. Despite what commercials and cards might be trying to tell you, there's a lot more to Christmas than good cheer and God blesses everyone. It's cold and it gets darker way earlier, and there's seasonal depression, and it can be insufferably lonely. As Dickens shows, Christmas is an important time to reflect. Go inward, face your demons, confront your mortality before emerging in a new year, changed for the better and ready to face new challenges. So think about some ghosts and level up. But on a less morbid note, telling ghost stories is also communal. It brings people together. And the stories are always in good fun, meant to thrill and entertain in a positive, cathartic way. As M.R. James writes in the intro to his collection, Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, if any of them succeed in causing the reader to feel pleasantly uncomfortable when walking along a solitary road at nightfall or sitting over a dying fire in the small hours, 
my purpose in writing them will have been attained. If you want to keep the tradition alive this holiday season, whether in person with family or friends, over Zoom, or just reading some stories on your own, I've compiled a handy list of some of my personal favorite tales in the description below. I hope it helps you get in the Christmas spirit. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs>